Hi there, and welcome to Foundations in Psychology. In this video, we're going to discuss the different ways in which we detect sensory information from our environment. In particular, we're going to focus on absolute thresholds, difference thresholds, Weber's law, and signal detection. We're going to work through the definitions of each of these topics, as well as describe how each is important for our understanding of how we perceive sensory stimuli in the environment. Let's begin with an example. Let's say you were putting on a piece of music or you were beginning to watch a video on the internet and so you, you press play, uh, but the volume is off. The volume is set to zero. Now, presumably, you want to be able to hear the music or hear what the person in the video is saying, so you slowly start increasing the volume, whether this is on, on your computer or on a phone and, and you click buttons to increase the volume, or if you're listening on a stereo, you slowly start turning the dial up to increase the volume. What you'll probably notice is with one click of the button, maybe with two click of the buttons, or certainly with a very small movement of the dial, you still don't hear anything. So naturally, you keep increasing the volume until that point at which where you first are able to detect the sound. It probably won't be as loud as you are planning for it to be, but you increase the volume slowly until that exact point in which you can now say, okay, even though it's faint, I can now hear the music or I can now hear the person speaking in the video. You've just reached what we call the absolute threshold. We define the absolute threshold as the minimum amount or minimum intensity of a stimulus, in this case the volume, the sound that you're listening to, the minimum amount or intensity that is required to detect that stimulus. So as you increase stimulus intensity, in this case from a volume of zero to slowly increasing the volume until the point at which you can first detect that stimulus, when you can first hear the sound coming from the speakers, this is the absolute threshold. Now, let's say you decided to do this a couple times. You started from zero, would increase until you first detect the sound, you've reached the absolute threshold, and then you go back to zero and try it again. What you might find, if at first it took you maybe two or three button presses or you know three or four ticks on the dial of the stereo before you reach that absolute threshold, the second time you try this, you might get a different number. You may reach a different absolute threshold. It may be only two clicks, or sometimes it might take you up to five or six before you actually first detect hearing that stimulus. That's because the absolute threshold can change from situation to situation. And everybody's going to have a different absolute threshold, depending on how good their ears are, or how closely they were listening um, to hear that first sound. So really, when we defined these types of thresholds, we would define the absolute threshold as the minimum intensity or minimum amount of that stimulus required to first detect that stimulus reliably about 50% of the time. So what this means is if you did this exercise 10 times, volume to zero, slowly increase until you hear something, volume back to zero, slowly increase until you hear something, the absolute threshold would be the number that's required to reliably detect the sound for about half of those trials. Okay, so let's say that you were listening to this song or this piece of music or, or watching this video with a friend. And so the volume is loud enough that we have exceeded our absolute threshold. Both of you can hear the music, both of you could hear what's going on in the video, but at a certain point your friend turns to you and says, would you mind increasing the volume? Would you mind making it louder? So you go to your device or you go to the stereo and you increase it a little bit, maybe another two to three clicks or another slight turn on the dial. What may happen then is your friend turns to you again and says, oh, I didn't notice a change. Did you even increase the volume? Now you know that you did increase the volume, but it was a small enough increase or a small enough change in intensity that your friend didn't detect it, didn't notice a difference from before. So what we would say is the change to the intensity of the stimulus, the amount of volume that you increased, was not enough to reach your friend's difference threshold. We define a difference threshold as the smallest amount of change that is required to be reliably detected. So basically, how much do I need to increase or decrease a stimulus before an actual change is detected? As with absolute thresholds, the difference threshold is going to vary from situation to situation, and it's also going to be different between people. 
So again, formally, we define the difference threshold as the minimum amount of change required to detect that change or to, to detect a difference in stimulus intensity reliably 50% of the time. So if you were to measure the difference threshold 10 different times, the amount of change that would be required for about five of those trials, you could reliably and confidently say this is the difference threshold. This minimum amount of change required to actually detect a change in stimulus intensity, we call the just noticeable difference, or sometimes referred to as the JND. Now this term makes sense. It's the difference required for something for the change to be just noticeable. Let's return to our previous example where we were sitting listening to music with a friend. And the friend turns and says, could you turn the volume up? Now, let me ask you this question. If, to start, you and your friend were listening to the music at a very low volume, it was very quiet, do you think you would need a small increase in order to reach that difference threshold? In other words, do you think the JND, the just noticeable difference, would be small? Or would you need to really crank up that volume? Would the JND be large? Alternatively, if you and your friend were listening to the music very loudly, it was already, the volume was already cranked way up, and your friend says, hey, can you turn up the volume a little bit? Do you think you would need a small increase or a large increase in order to detect the actual change? In other words, do you think the JND, the just noticeable difference, would be small or would be large? Well, if you guessed that when already listening to the volume at a very low, quiet level, you would only need a small increase, the JND would be quite small. And if you were listening to the song at an already very high volume, you would then in turn need a larger increase. In other words, the JND would be larger. You're correct. In fact, we know that when the stimulus intensity is low, the amount of change required to reach that difference threshold will be smaller. The JND will be smaller. However, if the original stimulus intensity is already quite high, if you're already listening to the volume uh, at a very high level, you're going to need a larger increase in order to actually detect that change. The JND will be larger. So we can say that the amount of change required to notice a change in stimulus intensity is going to be proportional to the original stimulus intensity. If the intensity was already low, you're only going to need a small change in order to actually detect that change. However, if the original intensity was quite high, you're going to need a proportionately larger change to detect that change in stimulus intensity. The JND will be larger. This idea was formally put into an equation by Ernst Weber, and we now call it Weber's Law. Weber's Law simply states that the just noticeable difference between two stimuli are going to change as a proportion of those stimuli, as we've just described. So, for example, let's say we were running an experiment, we were testing just noticeable differences, and we played somebody a sound, let's say at 50 decibels, decibels is just the measurement unit for volume, so we played somebody a sound at 50 decibels, and hypothetically let's say we needed a 5 decibel change in order for the participant to say, yes, I actually now hear that you have changed the volume. So in this case, the just noticeable difference, the JND, is 5. If we wanted to run a follow-up experiment, and in the second experiment we played participants a sound played at 100 decibels, using Weber's law we would actually be able to calculate or predict what the just noticeable difference was going to be. So considering in the first experiment the just noticeable difference was 5 for an original volume of 50, and in our second experiment we've now doubled that original volume we've gone from 50 to 100. Using Weber's law, we can say, well, because we've doubled the stimulus intensity from the first experiment, then we know that the JND is also going to be doubled. So in the second experiment, the JND would be 10, twice as much as 5. So far, we've been using examples in the auditory modality. We've been talking about the absolute threshold of some music we're listening to, 
or the just noticeable difference in increase or decrease of the volume of what we're listening to. But really, any of these concepts can apply to any of the different sensory modalities. We could use all the same examples or run all the same experiments with light, for example. You start in a dark room, slowly increase the brightness of a particular light, and ask when do participants reliably detect the light? That again would be the absolute threshold. And once we've reached the absolute threshold, what amount of change is required to reach participants difference threshold? And then what is this difference threshold? What is the JND going to be based on the original intensity or the original brightness of that light? If volume and light are not your cup of tea and you're looking for another example, I think a fun example is food and the amount of salt that we put in our food when cooking. So imagine we have a dish that has no salt. We've started at the bottom, zero salt, just like we had zero volume, just like we had zero brightness. In this dish, there is no salt. If we slowly started sprinkling in salt, at which point would the person eating the food be able to detect the presence of that salt and say, oh yes, I can now taste the salt in this dish. Great, there's your absolute threshold. Now, if you have a dish that is already fairly salted, how much salt do you have to add before the person says, well, this now tastes saltier than it did before? That difference, right, that just noticeable difference, you've now reached your difference threshold. And if we start with the first dish that did not have very much salt compared to a dish that has lots of salt, how much salt is going to be needed to be added to each dish before we actually detect that change in salt? According to Weber's law, you're going to need a much lower amount of salt in the first unsalted dish compared to the dish that already has a fairly high salt component. You're going to have to throw a lot more salt in there before the person actually says, yes, I detect a change in the saltiness of this dish. Now, as we've discussed so far, once the intensity of a stimulus, whether that stimulus be sound or light or so on, once that intensity reaches our absolute threshold, it is, reaches a level where we can perceive it and we say, yes, I can detect that stimulus. I can hear that sound or I can see that light. However, what this also means is that in some cases, stimuli are presented, there are sounds or there are, are lights, but the intensity is, is not high enough for us to detect it. It hasn't quite reached our absolute threshold. So in these situations, we'd say the stimulus was there, but it was undetectable. We didn't perceive it. And based on what we've talked about so far, this makes intuitive sense, but I think we've all had experiences as well when we think we hear something that maybe isn't actually there, or we're not quite sure if there is some sort of sensory information present or not. So the question becomes, how do we make the decision to say, yes, I perceive this sensory stimulus, or no, I'm not perceiving anything, I don't think anything is being presented. And this brings us to our final topic of the day, something called signal detection theory. And signal detection theory states that our ability to say, yes, I perceive this stimulus, is a result of the sensory information coming in, the sights, the sounds, the smells, so on and so forth, and then our judgment of whether, yes, that sensory information is present, or no, I do not perceive that sensory information. Now, signal detection theory can get pretty complicated pretty quick. Ultimately, this becomes a question of, yes, I perceive some sort of sensory information as present, or no, I do not perceive any sensory information being present. Now, this question can be asked in two different contexts. In the first context, let's assume that yes, that sensory information is present. There is a sound being played, or there is a, a light being shone. We can then say, yes, I perceive that, if it reaches our absolute threshold, or no, I do not perceive that, if it hasn't quite reached our absolute threshold. But we can also ask this question in another context, when there is in fact no sensory information being presented. We can still ask the question of, do I perceive something, even though technically it isn't there, or no, I accurately do not detect any sensory information. Let's use an example I think most people are familiar with. Let's assume you are home alone and you think you hear a noise. Well, did you actually hear that noise? Or was it a figment of your imagination or something unrelated? Okay, 
are you actually detecting a signal or are you perceiving or detecting a signal that isn't actually there? So this is the question of signal detection theory. We either accurately perceive something that is there or we incorrectly don't perceive something that is present or we perceive something that actually isn't present or correctly we don't perceive something that isn't present. Research in psychology looking at our ability to accurately detect stimuli in the environment has pointed to certain factors that influence whether we think we perceive something that isn't there or whether we accurately perceive something that is present. For example, if you are trying really hard to hear something, first of all, you might be quicker to hear it. Your absolute threshold will probably be lowered and you'll be better able to accurately say, yes, I hear it when it's present. But on the flip side, you might also be more likely to think that you hear it even when you don't. Similarly, if you're distracted while listening for something, you may be less likely to detect it once it's present, in which case your absolute threshold is being raised, but you will also be less likely to make a mistake and think that you hear something even when it isn't there. Okay, so to wrap up, in this video we've talked about the absolute thresholds, the smallest amount or smallest intensity of a sensory stimulus required in order for somebody to be able to detect the presence of that stimuli. We've talked about difference thresholds and just noticeable differences, which is the smallest amount of change in a stimulus intensity required to actually be able to detect that, yes, the intensity of that stimulus has changed. We learned about Weber's law, which states that the just noticeable difference is going to change as a proportion of the original stimulus intensity. Stimulus intensities that began low will only need a small amount of change. Okay, so they will have smaller just noticeable differences, whereas stimulus intensities that started very high will require a larger amount of change in order to be detected. So they will have larger just noticeable differences. And finally, we touched on signal detection theory, which is an area in psychology that asks questions about how accurately we are able to detect or reject the presence of certain stimuli in the environment. We hope you enjoyed today's video. If you have any questions about anything discussed, please feel free to post your questions in the comments. And if you have any suggestions for a future video, or if there are any topics that you would be interested in us covering in a future video, please feel free to also post those suggestions in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe to the channel.